Speaking of the convictions of human beings, one of the <laughs> things that your book pointed out is that people think that the myth of awe is that it's only experienced by the wealthy or privileged. Yeah. But you actually went and visited Sam Quentin prison and it led yeah. you down the path of dismantling this myth. What yeah. did you find from that experience? Man, you are asking such a good question. So I really appreciate it. But it's interesting that scientists in the happiness literature hadn't studied all that much till 15 years ago for various reasons. But I think one of the reasons was that there is this conception that awe is for the wealthy, for the privileged, and it really is most robustly felt in high price tag rarefied experiences. Like, well, I flew by helicopter into the Rockies and skied down this one mountain that no one had ever skied before. Or I went to the Barrier Reef in Australia and, and stayed at this fancy resort. And I was a little worried about that. And I had this intuitive sense as our research started to come in of the truth of everyday awe, which is a central theme in this book, is we can find it anywhere. I've had a couple of moments of awe in our conversation so far, right? So it's all around us. It's, there's everyday awe to benefit from. It's a basic state of mind. And John, I don't know why, but when my brother was dying, and people's passing leads you to interesting areas of exploration. And I have always wanted to help our criminal justice system and used to volunteer at San Quentin Prison, where a lot of people on death row are. And part of this restorative justice program. And I would go every four to six months, spend a whole day in prison inside, uh, usually just with four or five volunteers, six volunteers, and then 180 prisoners. And if you're around prisoners, <laughs> as I have been for dozens of hours, one of the things, they all work out prolifically. And it was awe-inspiring. I'm like, man, I am the weakest guy out of these 180 <laughs> guys. And I'm a pretty good athlete. I'm like, all right, this is all inspiring. But I got in there and I was giving a talk and I was standing in front of them and I'm a white guy with privilege and know that, and but grew up poor. And I was looking out and I'm like, I felt like I got to know, I was about to talk about awe, the feeling of we have when we encounter vast mysteries. It was one of those moments I was like, the last thing I think these guys want to hear is like some professor from Berkeley lecturing them about awe. So I was like, I want to hear their voices. And I said, what has brought you awe recently? And these are guys living inside a prison. Prison cells are tough. The food sucks. They don't get to see their families. It's a tough life. Their lives are significantly shorter. The healthcare is not good. And I said, what brings you awe? They hesitated a little. There's a little bit of quiet. And then suddenly the answers came out. And it was just like holding my granddaughter's hand, studying the Bible, getting my high school degree, learning how to read, playing basketball, looking at the clouds and the fog. I was blown away. I truly have not heard better answers to the more illuminating answers. And that led me to the, I think the central thesis of the book, Outside of Moral Beauty, is awe is everywhere. We get such benefits from it. Just Take a step back and open your mind to it and think about where it is around you and it'll bring you some good. And I learned that from these prisoners. And then the themes of moral beauty came into striking relief for me because there are prisoners inside every prison who are really bringing peace to prisons, right? Who are through meditation or Bible study or music, they really want to become good human beings. And it just astounded me to be close to that. Well, in some ways, it, Dacker, it didn't surprise me that you found this because I think in this super fast-paced world that we live in our, today, the one thing that most people don't do is spend time with themselves. And when yeah. you're in a prison, you've got no choice but to process all your regrets, yeah. what got you there to, in the first place. And so I would imagine the littlest things start becoming so meaningful when you put them in comparison to where they're at right now and how they're trying to get out of that place. John, so, it's hard to do research in prisons for various reasons, but you've just pointed to this hypothesis that just struck me. I have never been around people, and I've been in Buddhist monasteries and around 
professional sports teams and work with federal judges and doctors, but I've never been around people who are working harder on contemplating about their character and trying to get better, working really hard. And, and it was humbling to be close to that. They struggle, they get back into trouble for various reasons, but they really want to find their humanity, which is inspiring. Well, I used to volunteer at cold weather shelters for the homeless. And nice. I would talk to many of the men and women who were there. And what became shocking to me is how close each of us are to being a step away from being homeless. I remember talking to this gentleman and he was one of the leading cardiovascular surgeons in the state of Florida. And yeah. somehow or another, drugs entered his life and yep. he yep. lost everything. He lost yeah. his medical license, he lost his wife, his kids won't talk to him. And it was so interesting for me to talk to him because he is completely humbled now. But he said he, as smart as he is, as much as he's trying, he can't find a way out of where he's at because society doesn't really yeah. provide a glide path to getting we're, your we're life not, back. We're not good at that in the United States and it, compared to other cultures like Norway, where their prisons are really different. Yeah. And part of it for me, why I went in, John, is, and I wrote about this in The Power Paradox, my last book, part of my unusual background, my parents moved to this really poor rural town, very poor. There weren't pathways to success, like a lot of communities or quote success. I was lucky because my parents really stressed education and, and went to university and obviously some of my best friends were are the stories you just described of getting into drugs and ending up in prison it was one of my best friends in fifth grade and it's like man he had so much talent a misstep here or there or the adults that you would hope would be watching you weren't around and next thing you're in trouble and i think that's what i what drew me into san quentin in some ways